Welcome to our presentation today, um, based on the conference presentation I gave last year around the myth of those who can't do teach. So let's get started. Tēnā koutou katoa, no irirangi, no airani, no kōtirana, no wera, no witana, no inia o kūtipuna, no ngā, no, no ngā ruahine, no ngā titu wharetoa, no te aroa, no ngā, ngā te raukawa aku tamariki. E mihi ana ki ngā tohu o nehe o o tautahi, ko tēnei te whenua hei whāngai i oku tipuna, i aku tamariki, i aku whānau hoki. Ko tanya a te ngā hau, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome to our presentation today. Um, I wanted to talk about the findings that I came up with as a result of the research that I embarked on um, and my research, my final project was called A Music Room Remix, Six Narratives of Music Teachers in Secondary Schools in Aotearoa in New Zealand. It's around the experiences of being a music teacher and teaching high school. Um, and you're welcome to go look it up and, and elicit further points from it if you wish. If you have any questions, my email can be found at the end of this presentation, so you're welcome to get in touch. Um, initially, as a younger person, I never envisaged entering the postgrad space. It didn't seem like my scene. I didn't speak the same language as the people who were in that space. Um, and it was only with um, learning about emergent research technologies such as narrative, the narrative inquiry space, that I started to flourish more and want to talk about the stories of people. Um, I'm definitely a qualitative, get that right, qualitative researcher. Um, and it's about the nuances and the different colours and experiences of different people and their stories. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to talk about in my research or explore further in my research was about the idea of knowing through something, another way and other ways of knowing things. Um, I know we know about things like kinesthetic learners. I wanted to add to the body of knowledge around knowing through music and how it's, it was a challenge how to explain to people how to how what what it's like to know things in a musical sense. Indigenous people for millennia have used music as a way of knowing and a way of transmitting knowledge. Um, it has strong connections to nature, um, and there's a few other things that will come out of it as as we go through. One other further point: there's a lot of quotes from my participants in this presentation. I'm not going to read them all. I did in our original presentation. Feel free to just hit pause and read through. Um, the words of the of, our, of the participants in the study were quite interesting. Um, we had six participants sign up for the study. Um, they came from such a range of ages and backgrounds. They, the oldest one, trained in the seventies. Um, the youngest, the less experienced one, was a beginning teacher. Um, we had parents. We had three males, three female participants, um, and representation from like um, a lot, a wide range of genres. Um, maybe not the new, new genres, but certainly we had singer songwriters, classical musicians, um, classically trained vocalists, um, jazz musicians, funk, pop, rock musicians. I think pretty much a pretty broad spectrum of, of musical genres were represented within the study. And for the participants, um, they all had a tremendously strong connection with music. Most of them didn't start out being teachers. They learnt music through their family. Um, maybe their family were musical, so they inherited some traits to do with that. Um, Darren talks about whistling and humming all the time. Um, Sylvia talked about not knowing what else she would possibly do if she didn't have music. Um, and, and, and an expression of not understanding what people who aren't musicians, um, ex how they experience things. So there were some interesting little comments that came out. So just a few comments that you can read through there. Um, for other participants, music was such a really, really strong social binder. It was an intergenerational experience that they all learned and experienced and practiced through the home, um, through social connections, especially as teenagers and young, and young adults. Um, those friendships were maintained into adult life. Very much um, a social binder and an activity that participants did with family and people around them as often as possible. Um, nearly all of the participants had some kind of a career as a musician, whether full-time or part-time, before they entered teaching. Um, but as you can see from this slide, um, the music industry is traumatic. 
um, the income is really really low the stress is very high it's not a steady line of work um, depression is, is quite highly represented amongst musicians as a group um, music is so important for lots of reasons like well-being and, and like I said social connection but the actual industry is traumatic um, on top of very low um, incomes to start with um, when COVID hit the um, music industry in Aotearoa New Zealand was absolutely decimated um, as it, it did actually provide an income for so many people. And that could be one of the factors that our participants um, had in mind when they looked at entering the teaching space. And they all had interesting feelings and a range of feelings about why they wanted to become teachers. Um, I think being a musician, because they were musicians, that was one of the reasons they looked at teaching. Once participants, um, oh hang on, no, backtrack, sorry. Um, entering the teaching space was um, a result for participants of seeking economic stability. Um, the comment about being musicians, though, some participants were very much like, oh, well, I love doing this. And they really got a joy of teaching things that they knew about music to other people and seeing them share in that joy. So it was an uplifting experience for many participants um, being in the classroom. A lot of participants had already taught before um, private music were in the itinerant teaching space in schools, they could have a little bit of flexibility around traveling and still being able to perform and take on weekend and holiday gigs, um, or um, they just didn't actually know what else to do, so it seemed like a good idea. Once arriving in a school, um, participants talked in depth and detail in the study about a range of tensions that came up, and a lot of these tensions were tensions that threatened their musical identity or um, their ability to make music and their ability to be musicians. Um, the first round of tensions had to do with the system. Um, over the years there's been a huge growth in administration requirements for all teachers. Um, not only in CEA but tomorrow schools and all sorts of other things have come along over the years. Um, issues that some participants had around teacher reflections um, best done from an earnest position where you want to reflect and often exercises like teacher reflections became um, the mandatory of this meant that they weren't done um, or less authentic I suppose is the way to put it um, and there was a real sense amongst some of the participants that their grading and their ability to grade and, and make decisions around the um, results of their students assessments had been completely taken away from them with the, with the way that moderation is done as reflected by this comment here. The second round of tensions that we discovered was around schooling. Um, within schools music was often seen as a less important subject um, despite the fact that music classrooms tend to be very diverse places a lot of different kinds of students take up music um, a lot of students discover music when they're in high school and catch the bug so to speak um, but it's never seen as anything of worth because the curriculum is quite centered on job focused outcomes um, some of our participants were more around education for living, life skills, um, living a meaningful life and and as we know often a job is not the only meaning that we derive from life so they were looking for um, a wider curriculum focus. Um, they felt music was often at the bottom, schools often want a music, a music department, an orchestra or a band because it might make the school look good at prize givings and open nights but um, the ability to run those things fell on the goodwill of music teachers. Music's at the bottom, it's not going to lend you to a real job. Um, curriculum decisions, how many hours music gets in the curriculum, things like that um, were often backed up, underpinned by that belief. Um, many high school music teachers were experiencing young learners coming in, having no, little to no music education, to the point where, as illustrated in this next quote here, that we have students coming in who don't actually, um, can't actually name you a single song. Um, in the Māori curriculum and language curriculums we've had experiences with, you can start at level one when you get to high school. Um, there are unique challenges trying to start at level three or four in a curriculum when the students that are in your class are back at level one and can't even walk 
to a beat because they've had little musical experience or education of doing that. Um, music is also a very public subject in that sense too. So um, if you can't do math, um, for example, in this quote, um, Rose refers to maths. Um, if you can't do maths, not everybody in the classroom is going to know about it. But if you stand up to do a performance in music, it's a big jump um, and everybody can hear that you um, are a newbie. There are a lot of tensions around the actual role in itself. Um, the head of music role is essentially three jobs in one. And if you're a solo on your own music teacher, sole music teacher in your school, it can be very isolating. Um, job number one is running and administrating your whole music department, which includes um, managing your itinerant music staff. Um, some people have to have up to a dozen or 15 staff that come in um, and teach the students instruments and that program needs to be organised and um, those teachers need to be collaborated with. Um, the second role would be around extracurricular musical performances and, and musical groups. Um, teachers spend, tend to run a number, a large number of groups, two or three of groups for one teacher to run. Um, that's all your lunch times and after schools and sometimes weekends um, for performances that music teachers are doing. And thirdly, of course, there's the curriculum responsibility of what actually goes into the classroom. Now that last one is the one that teachers are known to, um, or the one that's paid for, but all the lunchtime stuff is often not acknowledged in the job load of a music teacher. So that means music teachers are time poor and when it comes to extra things like writing reports or uh, oh, the often spoken about end of year or middle of year sometimes board report, um, finding time to do those things were problematic and often ate into um, music teachers' performance and own practice time and um, family time as well. All participants, and this is a really interesting one and a really strong takeaway that I'd like to emphasise in this talk is all participants felt that it was essential for music teachers to be musical practitioners. How can you grade a performance if you had a, a poor understanding or a not a recent understanding of what it's like to be on the stage playing that piece of music? Um, that was very, very strongly felt and I'd like to raise that idea amongst a broader audience of the importance of being a practitioner in your learning area as well as an educator. Um, and finally, the other the other tension that came up around the role was it's a job that you're in which you are constantly interrupted by your teaching staff, by students who just need to grab find a music stand, or um, by other staff members. Um, and it's quite hard to sit down and actually work, as many of you also might be able to relate to, to work on one task for several hours. That you get you, you get the ability to do that in lots of other fields out there. So that made the job just a little bit more difficult. Have a couple of quotes there around that one. This one emphasises um, the importance of the music practitioner being the music educator. And how, moving on as we will do further in the presentation about how music teachers, um, the workarounds that they put in place to try and um, navigate the situation. The participants in this research liked their jobs, they did, despite the fact I've started with all the tensions. Um, there were lots of positives that they brought up. Um, they liked the fact that they could be themselves in the classroom, that meant being able to perform, that meant um, being able to teach the kinds of music that you knew. Um, it's a, there's, a, there's a level of autonomy in that role and good relationships with the students grow when you're an authentic teacher. Um, they found the space to be creative and collaborative. They had fun making music with their students. And um, for many, it became a substitute musical fix to being in, an, in a real musical group outside of school. School became the, the next best thing. Um, participants also spoke of that wonderful relationship that music teachers develop um, with their students over the whole time that they teach them. So from the beginning of year nine up until year 13, um, a lot of changes happen in the lives of adolescents, as you know, and um, it's wonderful to watch students grow and, and have that mu discover music and have those musical experiences. Um, one of the jobs that music teachers very much saw was the... Um, importance of creating musical opportunities inside and outside school. So going out on trips to do performances with your students was a very valuable um, way of spending time that teachers talked about. They loved that relational stuff. 
One um, participant in particular found that when he got into um, music teaching that he enjoyed the actual managing the department and building up the department more than that he did teaching, which was a really interesting one to read about. Um, and um, I guess it's that within the role there's that opportunity to find your strengths and work well on them and develop them. Um, a couple of quotes. It's very relational. Um, a lot of music teachers talked about creating that safe space in the music room at lunchtime, that place for um, our students and learners to go, where they could mix with older students, where they could jam. Um, everybody can be a little bit more equal in the music world if you're playing in a band. Um, I've noticed myself the whole to a kind of the relationship developing um, in the space of the music room where kids just want to hear what other kids can play. One of the participants in my study was Māori and he raised a few other um, a few other points that are um, worthy to mention around relationships with Māori students and assumptions that are made towards towards Māori students and Māori in the classroom. Um, Sean talked about often no one ever over assumed his ca his capabilities they always under assumed so he would always wear a suit when visiting the bank and things like that always showed up to class particularly well dressed um was assumed that he was a three chord guitarist um until he pointed out that he was actually had a degree in music from jazz school so just little interactions that like that, that always happened all the time with him and he had was just constantly getting that from people and from well-meaning people but um it's a little bit um hard for him to carry that over all the years um he found that his maori lecturers and educators never assumed that because he was maori he knew how to do a karakia or any of those other maori things um he's never been asked to do one by a maori lecturer but pakia tutors um at university would often fall into that trap of saying oh you're maori you must be able to do this um so at times there was a bit of whakamā around being maori for this participant um, once entering the teaching space, Sean found that there was a cultural taxation for Māori teachers to not only do all their job that they already have, as I've just outlined, the music teacher job is a busy one, but also to upskill other Māori teachers, oh sorry, other Pākehā teachers around them about tikanga, and to also um, somehow be responsible for the pastoral care of all Māori students, whether they be in his class or not which is an assumption that is often made in schools. Um, his his feedback about that is everybody's responsibility and um, I'm heartened to see about some of the developments that are happening around Matauranga Māori in different areas of content, including tens. Um, finally, this participant was particularly encouraged by the use of te reo Māori with his own children in primary schools, so watch this space as our children grow up. Participants came up with a range of um, workarounds to still um, maintain identity and feel like themselves and manage the pros and cons of the music teaching job. Some of these you might be able to relate to. Um, well, firstly, some of them just worked really long hours. Um, one scheduled rehearsals during meetings that he should be at. Um, he maintained the rehearsals were very important ones, um, so therefore he couldn't attend all of the meetings, especially when they were ones... Um, I felt between um, when they were ones that he didn't see as being useful meetings. Um, they all felt they must maintain being an active performer. That was like very, very crucial as part of their job as well as their personal life and their personal identities. Um, that did prove difficult, however, and some set up groups in their schools like orchestras that they could play in. They played in the bands for, for productions and things like that, and they got their musical fix that way. One participant created a bespoke role, which was a combination of itinerant teaching and classroom teaching. And that way she had to leave the school in between um, classes so nobody could ever find her and give her extra tasks to do. She was never at her desk and she found that to be quite liberating that she could leave school, go to another school um, to, teach, to teach her instrument. Um, some worked actually left their full-time roles to work part-time so that they could still take on gigs and travel, um, despite the pay cut and the financial hit from that. And some participants, well, one participant chose to leave teaching altogether, eventually taking on a role that meant um, they could participate in more musical activities outside of work. Um, why, why talk about all the stuff in a TENS presentation, you ask? 
um, I'm all about creating connections between different fields. The more we can talk to each other, the more we create um, empathy and understanding between each other. Um, the more we can apply other situations to our own um, and perhaps use them to seek our own mental balance and well-being. Um, so the questions that we came up with to what extent um, are you a practitioner in your field? Is that something you would like to get back to? Um, what sparks your thinking in practice? Remember that feeling you have at the beginning of the year when you're excited about classes starting? How do we keep that feeling going for longer? And thinking about your own personal wellness, how do you live a life that authentically aligns with your belief and your identity? Um, is what you're doing in your life and, and your job lining up and, and meets what you need um, and, and where your morals and beliefs lie. Um, so just some food for thought around making connections. Finally, thank you for listening. Here's my email address. Um, feel free to get hold of me if you um, have any more questions or um, it could be around entering a postgrad space. It could be around um, coaching, managing your work-life balance um, and it could be around just some points I may have brushed over and you want to learn a little bit more about in this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to wrap it up there.